Think you've seen everything there is to see in online television? Let us surprise you. Visit voiceamerica.tv today for sports, health, business, and more on demand 24-7. The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Variety Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericavariety.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Crime Prevention 101 with host Susan Bartlestone. We're so happy you've joined us. Over the next hour, you'll learn the tips, tricks, and vital information that will help you keep yourself confident and safe. Now, here's the host of Crime Prevention 101, Susan Bartlestone. Are you dreaming of Disneyland or maybe a long weekend getaway somewhere? Well, you know me, I've been spending my town time at the beach reading some great books thanks to my last show, Crime at the Beach. And you know how I hate to be a downer, but you need to know that while I'm at the beach or you're on vacation, someone might very well be sizing up our homes or businesses for a burglary. July and August particularly, according to the FBI, are the months when the most burglaries and property crimes take place. So tonight I thought I'd talk about burglary discouragement systems, as I call them, with Bob Tucker from the ADT Home Security Company. And I'm going to give you some great tips like the five best places to hide valuables that most burglars will never think of. And I've got some inexpensive psych-out strategies for you that should make any burglar pause. But to start us off and to take our mind off of those bothersome burglars for a bit, I've got some more summer reading suggestions for you. You know, my Crime at the Beach show, it's an annual show now, and it was so successful last week. And and thank you all for your great comments about the show, because I love it when I hear from listeners. But anyway, I thought I'd do a few more segments on summer reading for you throughout the summer. So first up, I'll be speaking with Ty Treadwell and Michelle Vernon, whose curiosity about the culinary cravings of condemned convicts (laughs) led to a best-selling book about their last meals. You know, how delicious does that sound? Then I'll be speaking with Ron Chepsuk, and a God, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. I pronounced it 50 different ways already tonight. And Ron is pretty much a Google of low life. He's written 25 books about mobsters, hitmen, conmen, gamblers, and drug dealers, and so forth, including a book with the intriguing title of Sergeant Smack. So you know that I'm talking smack with Ron tonight. And I've got a terrific personal safety product to tell you about this week. If you've got elderly relatives living on their own, you are really going to wear, really want to hear about this product. Well, thanks so much for being with me and joining me tonight. I'm Susan Bartlesome, and you're listening to Crime Prevention 101, coming to you live from the steamy New York City. And tonight, it's books and burglars as we take another refreshing dip in the literary pool and give you some suggestions to keep your home safe while you're away somewhere reading. All right, now here's the question. Did the murderous clown John Wayne Gacy have a craving for cotton candy before his final performance? (laughs) Did serial rapist slash killer Ted Bundy ask for filet mignon or a mundane turkey sandwich and hold the mayo? Well, let's meet Ty Treadwell and Michelle Vernon, co-authors of Last Supper's Famous Final Meals from Death Row, and we'll ask them. Hello, Ty and Michelle. Hi, Susan. Susan. Thanks for having us. Oh, this is great. Now, I absolutely adore the title of this book, and and, uh, we were talking briefly off air, and you were saying this is actually the 10th anniversary (laughs) of this book. So, Ty, let's start with you. How did you and Michelle get interested in this topic? I mean, it really does, you know, pique the curiosity. Well, depending on whether you like the book or don't like it, either the blame or the credit goes to Michelle. Um, <laughs> it, it, was, it was her idea. She roped me into it because um, I had the writing background and she had the interest in true crime, and she just noticed that... Um, in every article or news report about an execution, they always mention what the condemned man had for his last meal. 
Uh, so obviously this is something that, that everyone is interested in. And, and Michelle said, hey, this, this is interesting enough. We could make an entire book about it. And she was right. Well, Michelle, let me ask you this. Now, how did this custom of giving a special last meal get started? I mean, I, I, I wouldn't care if Ted Bundy ate dog food for his last meal. Why should we give him something great? Well, you know, actually, there, there are several theories on how this may have transpired. But back during the, uh, the 1800s, the cowboy days, uh, it was the tradition for the sheriff's wife to prepare their last meal. Mm. And in Europe, prior to that, there would be quite a distance from the place where they were actually held in prison to the, the hill where they would be hanged. And so there would be quite a parade that would take place. And there were lots of followers of the wagon, and they would stop into various pubs on the way, and people would buy drinks for the condemned. So it was like a big party. It, it was a big party, and mm-hmm. there actually have been some some of the condemned in the U.S. Uh, relatively recently, since '76, where there was a bit of a party, uh, allowed or not. Oh, huh. uh, do, do all states, uh, or is this a state-by-state state thing? Do, do, do all the states allow it, or only some? Or? Now, all the states do allow a last meal, but state-by-state, um, state, the, uh, the protocol varies greatly. Um, there are some states that will basically let you have anything you want to eat. Others will let you have anything that you want, but they'll put a price limit on it. And then some will say you can only have food that's available in the prison kitchen at the time. So um, it really does depend on which state you're being executed in. So where is it better to be executed? And I, did you get a big um, barbecue in Texas or something? Or? We, <laughs> Ty, Ty and I each have our favorites for that. Ah. <laughs> okay. Well, my favorite used to be Illinois, but Illinois has now banned the death penalty. Um, ah. And now... Now I think that we can both agree on Indiana. Indiana, I would say, is, is probably the top state now. And there, there was one person executed in Indiana several years ago where he actually had his mother come in and prepare his final meal in the prison kitchen. Wow. That, that's Mom definitely is- a unique offering from Indiana. Mama's home cooked food. Wow. Oh, yeah. Is there a, like, could, can you order out from the top restaurant or is there a standard amount that they'll allot? I mean, I guess it's going to be variable, but. Well, Cal- California had a, had a $50 limit. Uh, other states, uh, it's less. I believe Georgia was $20. And, <laughs> um, there, I can't, Ty, what was the state that was 40 uh, Florida is forty. Yeah, well, and then there are, some, there are some. That's a modest meal, you know. That's not consi- to, in, in in New York. We don't consider that a big, you know. Well, you know, <laughs> that's true. true. Well, poor Oklahoma has a fifteen dollar limit, and and they must order takeout. None of the last meals are cooked in the prison kitchen, so that pretty much means it's going to be fast food no matter what. Oh my God! All right. Well, let's let's go let's go right into this then. How many last suppers are in the new book? Oh, yeah, well, that's right. I want to see this one. How many last suppers have you put in the book, and how difficult is it to, to get access to the information? Um, uh, we've got somewhere in the area of, I want to say, around 40 or 50 last meals in the book, and most of the information is pretty easy to come by because, like I said, almost every news report does mention uh, the last meal. And if it's not mentioned in a news story, we have normally been able to find that information on each state's Department of Corrections website. No kidding. They post it on the website. They, because they do. Because people wow. want to know. Inquiring minds want to know. Because I, I kind of figured you had to write to the warden and you had to get a special release or something like that. I didn't, I didn't realize that would be something they'd put on a website, but... Okay, what do I know? Um, who are some of the most infamous criminals that you've got in the book, and what did they want to eat? Well, Hi. John Wayne Gacy is definitely one of the most famous. Um, did he want cotton candy? That was my suspicion. 
he, he did not want cotton candy. The interesting thing about him is that he used to work at Kentucky Fried Chicken, and he requested fried chicken as the main part of his last meal. So, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Okay, that's kind of mundane. How about he, he did uh, Ted Bundy? Career, what did he want? He had his career as the Kentucky Fried Chicken manager before he embarked on serial killing. Okay. <laughs> well, what are what are some of the other criminals that we might have heard about that made an impression on you? Well, we do have Carla Faye Tucker in the book, and and she was she was quite famous. Uh, prior to her execution, she was on multiple TV shows. It was always in the news because she was, you know, petite and cute and adorable and had uh, a great deal of remorse and had supposedly turned her life around. So she really was famous uh, during that period of time prior to her execution. That did not stop them from executing her, however, um, but she didn't have the most interesting last meal, but it was very petite and feminine. She had ah. a couple of pieces of fruit. She had a few crackers. It was nothing outlandish. Watching like, her like wait till the end. Oh, my God. That's right. Unbelievable. That would, oh, yeah, not, so. that would not be me. <laughs> no. No, no they, the would, they, would, they would take Some... me two hours to finish my last yeah. meal, I'm sure. Yeah. But some of these people order diet sodas. They order low calorie uh, desserts. It's it's really interesting. That is fascinating. There are some that have ordered uh, a large last meal, like some of the folks in Indiana that order just so many different things, and they they actually give that to them the day before because they really wouldn't have time to finish it all. They, uh, that much that it takes a day? Okay, now that's my kind of prisoner. That, <laughs> Indiana. That, that's definitely. Indiana. That, that would be me, although for 40 <laughs> bucks, I don't know how, how much I could order. But, in, but in you Indiana, have a there's great no limit. blog. I love, I love the blog that you've got. Give out the, the, um, the website for the blog so people can check this out because you guys are so funny. Death Row okay. Diner. You, there's a table for two execution style. These blog posts are true. Are tr- Terrific. Give out that blog. Yeah. Uh, it's lastsuppersbook.blogspot.com. And you've got some of the, um, do fries come with that lethal injection? You've got some of the excerpts. Uh, some, guy, uh, some guy had pizza, tacos, fried jalapeno sticks, french fries, fry okra, and ice cream. Although uh, you say you're not sure why he would want to mix sticky with the uh, with with ice cream, which is a good point, right? Yeah. I said nobody wants a prison riot in their stomach when they're trying to relax on the lethal injection table. <laughs> that is correct. That is uh, absolutely right. And you've got uh, some guy who killed two people, and uh, he wanted fried everything, pork chops, chicken fried fish, chili cheese fries, regular fries, yeah, I, mean, I guess French fries, fried food probably is, big, is a big favorite. Every, I think there was actually a riot in Rikers Island, which is a prison, which is a jail in New York, when they, they ran out of fried chicken. I seem to remember that, actually. Oh, my gosh. Wow. I yeah, see something that. like that a couple of years ago. Um, or I'll tell people where they can get the book and uh, what's coming next. Anything coming up next? Well, we're, oh. we're thinking about a, a second helpings of Last Supper's. Ah, I love it. Here you go. Yeah. And there's uh, there a woman out in Los Angeles who's convinced that she can turn our book into a TV show, so we're going to see if that happens. Oh, no. Are they going to actually have a reality show of people's last Oh, month? no, not reality. But there will oh, be okay. a real Good. cooking Good. segment. <laughs> that would make me lose my appetite, I have to tell you. No, uh, would, wouldn't be reality except for the cooking part. No. Right. All right, Ty, Michelle, it was great talking to you. Good luck with the book. You can get it on Amazon. Is there any other website you want to give out? Uh, Bar- um, Barnes & Noble, and we're, we're, we've got a page on Facebook now. Terrific. I'm, I'm signing up on Facebook as well. And I'm going to post links on my, on my Crime Prevention 101 blog as well. Thank you so much, guys, and good luck. Th- thank, thank you, Susan. Susan. All right, now, reviewers have described my next guest, as a high-octane journalist who could be a player for any major governmental intelligence bureau. When we come back, I'm going to be speaking with award-winning author of Sergeant Smack, 
Ron Chepsuk, and he's going to correct my pronunciation. Stay tuned. Stimulating talk it gets those synapses in the brain inspired really fast. All the time. The number one Internet talk station where your opinion counts. VoiceAmerica.com Violence, theft, drugs, graffiti, it's all part of joining a gang. In times like these, we need to protect our kids and our community from gangs. Gangs often prey on teens with low self-esteem who perform poorly in school and who seek a sense of belonging. Protect kids from gangs. Know who they're hanging out with. Encourage them to become involved in school activities. Give kids a positive alternative to gangs. To learn more, visit ncpc.org or contact your local law enforcement agency. A message from the U.S. Department of Justice, National Crime Prevention Council, and the Ad Council. Streaming live, the leader in Internet talk radio, voiceamerica.com. You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. We invite you to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, and Susan will address some of these on future shows. Send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com. That email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. Hello, this is Susan Bartlestone. This is Crime Prevention 101. This is the radio show with an optimistic perspective on a sober subject. Please start tweeting about us. Let people know we're here. There's plenty of show left. You can follow me on Twitter, too, by the way. Come join me on Facebook. Come join the movement. Got a quick tip for you before we talk to our next author. There are five places to hide valuables that burglars rarely look. A laundry bag in the bathroom or laundry room, in the washer or dryer hidden under a bunch of clothes, in a baby bag in the child's room, in the garage under a pile of grimy garage junk, and inside a drop ceiling tile. Just so you know. All right, let's talk smack. My next guest, next guest, Ron Chepsik, he said I did an okay job on that. Excellent He's an job. investigative journalist who's reported for more than 35 countries. He's a TV commentator about gangsters and organized crime, and he's the award-winning author of 25 books, his latest one, which has been optioned for a movie. And he's also the co-host of the very cool Crime Beat Internet radio show which he's going to tell us about, too. Hello, Ron. Hey, how are you, Susan? It is just a pleasure to have you with me. Well, thank you. Now, your latest book has been optioned for a movie. Now, is that the Sergeant Smack book? Right, Sergeant Smack was the book which I've been uh, working on uh, promoting for the last year, and I came out with another book called Straight from the Hood, uh, which is uh, a smaller book, but the uh, Sergeant Smack uh, was optioned about three or four months ago um, our lawyer, we had, we got an entertainment lawyer like you, like you normally do, and he uh, worked out as a deal. And uh, I'm working with three other people on the script and uh, on the, um, uh, you know, for the movie. Uh, we're going to try to raise, uh, you know, millions of dollars, what you need to uh, to make it work. And mm-hmm. uh, they're the people I'm working with are, are optimistic that we can maybe go into production um, next year. And the book, uh, Sergeant Smack, is if you see an American gangster. You know the, the big movie with Denzel Washington sure. and Russell Crowe. Well, one of the characters in that movie was a guy named Nate. He was the uh, light-skinned uh, black guy in Bangkok that was supposed to be the cousin of Frank Lucas. Uh, that is the, what the who's the book about? And essentially, Frank Lucas uh, stole the story from from Ike. So the the book sort of uh, tells a true story what happened in Asia, and it's so a remarkable the, the, story. The, the full title is Sergeant Smack: The Legendary Lives and Times of Ike Atkinson. Kingpin and his band of brothers. So right. now, tell us who is who. Who I you, kind of we kind of backdoored into it, but tell us a little more about who Ike Atkinson is, and also why was he called Sergeant Smack, and what made you interested in writing about him? Okay, how did you know he was? He was well, real he was person? called Sergeant Smack, and and Ike doesn't like uh, being called that because uh, he spent twenty years. Of honorable service in the military, and uh, he he uh, he left the military re- retired. He was a master sergeant, and uh, w- uh, he was a professional adventurer and gambler. And uh, he grew up in uh, in uh, poor uh, rural area of uh, North Carolina uh, in Goldsboro, and um, he just got this sense of adventure. Uh, 
And uh, when he got out of the military, he went uh, all over the world gambling. He was a professional gambler. Uh, he made friends with a whole group of, uh, of uh, uh, ex-black soldiers. That's why it's called the Band of Brothers. He had this network. And they gravitated to Bangkok during the Vietnam War, when the Vietnam War was, it was reaching its height in the mid-60s. And from there, he got into the, the heroin trade. And uh, over an eight-year period, uh, seven-year period, actually, 68 to 75, uh, he uh, trafficked $400 million worth of heroin. Uh, okay. from Asia to uh, North Carolina until he got caught, which is what happens to every gangster. They all get caught. <laughs> then um, we should just uh, let everyone know that doesn't know that smack actually is, uh, I guess, a euphemism for uh, heroin. Right, heroin, right. Yeah. And the sergeant, of course, is from his military service, and the DA gave that. It was the code name for the, uh, for the operation to take Ike down. Ah, I see. So these were all ex-soldiers. Right, no right. longer in the military. But they were living as civilians? In... Right. They got out of the military, and uh, they just stayed in Europe. They liked Europe. Uh, this was after World War II. Uh, you know, there was, it, was a, it was a good lifestyle. It was cheap to live there. And uh, there was all kinds of gambling going on, especially in the military bases. And, uh, you know, they made a lot of money. They were able to live. And, uh, and uh, you know, they enjoyed themselves, and, and they had a great time. And uh, they lived like there was no tomorrow. And Ike didn't really have to be a, a drug trafficker. He could easily have have uh, spent maybe another couple of years in, in gambling and uh, probably retired, uh, you know, uh, quite, uh, quite wealthy for the money he was making. Because he was actually, n- he was not uh, doing anything illegal for the, the 20 years he was in the, uh, in the military, right? Uh, no, no, but he uh, actually, <laughs> he actually got, uh, got uh, court-martialed once for uh, gambling because uh, he was gambling where he wasn't supposed to gamble, the way Ike explained it. Ike was a, was a master sergeant, and he was ga- gambling with the rank and file, and that was against military uh, protocol. So he uh, got busted a couple of uh, uh, notches in his rank, but to his credit, he got, he got his rank back. Uh, and when he left, you know, he was a master sergeant. If he never got in trouble, he might have, might have risen higher in, in, uh, in the military. Mm. But when he was in Asia... He had free travel anywhere in the world, and he was able to use the military's uh, transportation system, air system, to smuggle the heroin. He used couriers. He used uh, uh, the the, uh, uh, postal system, the military postal system. He he got soldiers when they were going back on leave uh, or uh, or just going back to the States, period, to uh, smuggle drugs, and uh, that's how he did it. And he did it for eight years until he got caught. So this is this was the band of brothers. They were they were all smuggling the drugs back and forth. Right, right. They were all part of the ring, and uh, and and finally uh, in 1975, they they he was so big that uh, they set up a special task force. Uh, the DEA mm-hmm. did that tracked Ike over three continents: uh, uh, Europe, uh, Asia, and the United States. And uh, uh, and it, and they they devoted an incredible amount of resources to bring him down, and he was mm-hmm. finally brought down. Uh, Essentially, from a palm print, which he had on one of the bags, he actually uh, had his palm print. That was one of the major pieces of evidence that brought him down in his trial. He went to jail, or he was sentenced to 44 years. He spent 32 consecutive years in jail, and that's how I found him, because I was doing a book called Gangsters of Harlem, and I was interviewing Frank Lucas just before he became famous, an American gangster, and he kept mm-hmm. referring to Ike as his cousin and all these things he did with Ike. So I said I had to check this, track this guy down, and I, I found out that he, you know, it, it was hard to find where he was because there was nothing written on him in 32 years, uh, in, 19, in 2007. And uh, I finally got a um, uh, contact. He was at Butner. Unfortunately, it was only three hours away from me. And so uh, I, uh, I wrote the, uh, the warden, and he kindly granted me an interview with him, and that's, that started our relationship. So and now he, um, what was his real relationship with Frank Lucas? Did they? Did they well, uh, Frank I mean, Lucas. Frank... In the movie, if you see the movie, it sounded as if Frank Lucas was the guy that uh, that pioneered the uh, the connection from Asia. But actually, Frank uh, Lucas bought his drugs from uh, from uh, from Mike Atkinson. Number two, ah. he wasn't his cousin for some strange reason. He wasn't his cousin. No, no, but he keeps claiming that he's his cousin, which, which, which drove I nuts. Maybe it's like, because like you know, all men are my brother related or related by blood, Maybe right? One of those things. And there's no way that they can. And there's no way that they're related. Number three, which really infuriated Ike and really was his motivation to do the book with me, 
was that Lucas claimed that he moved drugs in the caskets of dead GIs back to the United States. And uh, Ike said, when I interviewed him in jail, he said, adamantly, that never happened. He said, I'd never do that. You know, I'm a military guy. And when I, when I investigated it, uh, I found out that, that there was absolutely no evidence that that ever happened. And so, you know, Lucas essentially lied about it. But that was the kicker in the movie, American Gangster. You know, that was the climax in the movie. That's what made it so incredibly, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, remarkable to a lot of uh, moviegoers, you know, was the fact that, you know, that when they found out how Fra- uh, Lucas was getting his drugs back, he was supposed, supposedly doing it in the caskets. I don't know if you saw the movie. There was a famous scene in that movie with Russell Crowe. You know, no, I actually did not see right. that movie, but I think that the the script writers must have taken a lot of license. Right, you know, make- you know they use that in Hollywood, they, uh, based on a true story. <laughs> well, they really, really took liberty with it in this case. I'd say about 10% of the movie is probably true. Hmm. Well, but you know, that's Hollywood, right? Reputation, you know, God you- knows what's going to happen to Sergeant Smack. When <laughs> actually get well, you know, it's a different story. And uh, you know we're not going to pay too much attention, to Lucas. We're going to uh, we're we're doing the story from from Ike's point of view. You know it can stand on its own own legs, and it's really remarkable uh, story. You know Ike never carried a gun, and he never mm-hmm. used drugs. He was very straight. He never drank. Never never used drugs at all. Uh, no, he never. Knew, in, in fact, you know in 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 the military, it's very common with marijuana, and he never used any of that. And you know he never never touched any drugs, and and uh, he he didn't drink. And uh, he he liked a cigar, but he never lit it up. <laughs> he walked okay. around with a cigar. Some of his friends told me when I was when I was researching the book, and he never carried a gun. He said it just wasn't worth it, you know. And he never mm-hmm. he never he never killed anybody. Uh, well, he, you know, his drugs did, which I I can miss. And he's the first guy to admit that he he made a big mistake in his life when he got involved with the drug trade because you know it took him away from his family, his son. He saw him at uh, sure. ten and never sure. saw him again till he was forty two. So, you know, he realized he paid a big price, and so he's talking uh, about uh, this to young kids who might try to idolize him, uh, you know, because you do a book and you always worry about that, that the people, mm-hmm. you'll get the wrong message. So he's, he's spoken at church groups, and, uh, and uh, whenever, whenever we gave book signings, you know, he always talks about, you know, the, uh, the lessons from his own life and, you know, how he wasted it, and he had so many things going for him and made wrong choices. You know, maybe I should have you and I come back on the show and talk oh, about loves, that. He's 85 years old, and he's he, he cannot walk uh, me for sure. I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I'd love to have reform criminals on, and I will. So let's uh, let's talk about that. It would make I think it would make a very good uh, follow up, maybe to what we're doing now. And you you guys are, have become pretty pretty good friends, I think. Right? Oh yeah, we, we're more than uh, just uh, author and subject. We we become uh, real good friends, and. Uh, and uh, you know uh, we're best friends, in fact. So, and he's he's really charismatic, which is you know he's I, I've still I still look at him sometimes and I say, how did you ever get I, to myself? How did you ever get involved with that? Because you had so many other things going for you. And he doesn't really know why he did it, but he was an yeah, adventurer. He really I think doesn't he sound risk. like a typical gangster or criminal, really. No, he's at not, all. You know, he was a risk taker, which is not the same as a gangster. And he loved to jump out of planes. You know, I mean, why <laughs> why <laughs> sell, sell drugs? That's so right. That's right. You know, but he loved gambling, and 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 you know, he doesn't even gamble today anymore. He hasn't gambled, he said, in 25 years. When he went to jail, he st- he just stopped. So he didn't really even need need that, you know. And he told me that that when he got out of the military in World War II, uh, his friend uh, um, and him uh, were uh, his friend took advantage of the GIBL. The GIBL just came into existence, and his friend was trying to talk him into going to college. And Ike was a you know, high school graduate, and he decided that he wanted to be a gambler. So that, well, that was the pivotal decision on his life. His friend went on to become an engineer, and he went on mm-hmm. to become a gangster and spend, you know, a good right. part of his life in jail. Well, sounds like it's going to be a terrific movie, and uh, I'm looking forward to that, and let's talk more about a follow-up. But I want, before we run out of time, I want you to talk about Crime Beat, your radio show. Right. And very quick, any projects you're working on. Right. Well, Crime Beat uh, is... Um, uh, radio show, Artist First uh, uh, Radio, ArtistFirst.com, www.artistfirst.com, and uh, it's a broad uh, crime show. I do everything from the uh, uh, secret nuclear smuggling trade to John Gotti's adopted uh, son, and uh, we focus on all aspects of crime, and it's, it's uh, essentially an interview show with, uh, with uh, some items in the news. We discuss it. I have a co-host, uh, Willie Hareb, uh, who's um, my old friend from Thunder Bay, a boyhood friend, and uh, 
and he's the co-host, and uh, and uh, it, it, it's on every uh, Thursday at 8 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And go to www.artistfirst.com, and all Artist. shows are archived, so you can listen to them like like your show, twenty four seven. Like like crime prevention went on, absolutely. Right, and right, working that great. That's the beauty find, of the internet, right? Excuse me. That's the beauty of internet radio. Indeed. And give out your website where they can find. Okay, uh, they can go to www. Period. Strategic books. Um, um, uh, Strategic media books. dot com. Www. Strategic media books. dot com. The latest book is Straight from the Hood. It's up there, and uh, we didn't have time to talk about that. But it's a collection of stories uh, that don't really warrant a book in themselves, but are really interesting about uh, crime in the inner city. And they range all, right. all the way from uh, Al Capone Great. to how Denzel Great. Washington got his break in, in uh, movie business. All right, Ron, you know what? Thanks so much. I'm going to put Sergeant Smack on the reading list, and I'm going to post links to all of these things on crimeprevention101.com so people can go right there if they want more information. July and August are the prime months to burglaries because of those vacations and long weekends. When we come back, I'm talking with Bob Tucker from ADT Home Security, and we've got some very practical strategies to discourage burglars for you. Stay tuned. Talk, talk, talk. That's all we do is talk. Yeah! If you'd like to talk, call us toll-free right now at 1-866-472-5787. one 472 5787 That's it. That's it. VoiceAmerica.com. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can be prevented. Using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real-life examples and success stories, Susan shows how it's done in her new book, Think Fast and Prevent a Violent Crime, How to Respond to Danger in 20 Seconds or Less. Check out www.crime prevention101.com for more information. If you think you've seen online TV before, let us surprise you. VoiceAmerica.tv is online now. The leader in live Internet talk radio has done it again. Multiple channels, a state-of-the-art viewing experience, live and on-demand programs streaming 24 hours a day. It's exactly what you want, when you want it. VoiceAmerica.tv. From health and wellness to business, sports, and everything in between. Discover our new world. Visit VoiceAmerica.tv now and experience the future of online television. VoiceAmerica.tv. You're walking alone. A group of people is hanging out just ahead. Suddenly, they surround you. Hey, yo, where you going? Come here. Before you know it, you're being robbed. It's called a pack robbery, a robbery involving a group of assailants, and it can be violent. In times like these, trust your instincts. Don't become their next victim. Avoid suspicious groups. Avoid desolate or poorly lighted areas. Be aware of your surroundings. To learn more about pack robberies, visit ncpc.org or contact your local law enforcement agency. A message from the U.S. Department of Justice, National Crime Prevention Council, and the Ad Council. Stimulating talk it gets those synapses in the brain inspired really fast. All the time, the number one internet talk station where your opinion counts. VoiceAmerica.com. You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. We invite you to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, and Susan will address some of these on future shows. Send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com. That email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. Yes, hello again, indeed. This is Susan Bartlestone. And don't forget that Crime Prevention 101 is available on iTunes. You can take us with you wherever you go on your vacation. And speaking of vacation, are you longing for a luau on a lanai or some other great getaway? Well, here's a tip. Unless your Facebook and other social media privacy settings are set for good friends and family only, do not announce your vacation plans beforehand or tweet endearing photos of the family at that luau. Wait until you come home to share because tech-savvy burglars are now checking social media sites to determine their next target. And don't change your home answering machine announcement either. Now, let's meet our home security expert, 
Bob Tucker is the Director of Public Relations for ADT, which is one of the world's leading electronic security companies, and he travels all over the country telling people how to protect their homes and businesses. And if you are dreaming about a Disneyland vacation, like I mentioned earlier in the show, Bob might be able to help you with that, too, because prior to working with ADT, he was Director for Public Affairs at Disneyland in Anaheim. Hi, Bob. Good evening, Susan. Thank you for having me. You can help me with everything. <laughs> I'm here to serve. All right. So let's, uh, let's tell everyone the, the actual definition of what a burglary is, what we're actually talking about here. Uh, people breaking into homes. Well, breaking into homes, right, with or without the use of force. I want to make that clear. It doesn't have to be forceful. It's still considered a burglary. Correct. And if you happen to be home at the time of the break-in, then we refer to that as, an, as a home invasion. Uh -huh. So t today I want to talk about residential crime because I know you deal with both the business, commercial, and, uh, and residential. I want to deal, talk about when you're not at home because we know that July and August are the peak months for this kind of property crime. Uh, do you have uh, any good figures about uh, the number of burglaries that have been committed yearly? Well, we do know, according to the FBI, that there's a burglary about every 15 seconds in the U.S., and that crimes to property, like we're talking about here, like to homes, make up the, uh, more than 75 percent of all crimes reported nationwide. So it's a, it's a big problem, and, you know, we've, we've seen an increase um, in this type of crime over the last several years because of the down economy. Now, while crime rates in other parts of the country um, and violent crime like homicides and rapes are down, property crimes like home burglaries are actually up in many parts of the country. And as you stated, during the summer months, which we're in right now, they peak. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's true, because people are away. Absolutely, and you're outside. You don't even have to be on vacation. I mean, you're down the street, you know, talking to the neighbors, having a barbecue. You went over to the baseball field for a Little League game. Um, you leave your doors and windows open because of the cool breeze. Um, and, you know, you're just a lot more vulnerable because of that. So it's not, uh, not, it's not only about being away from vacation, but it's just about, you know, letting loose a little bit and uh, opening up your home more. And I think I, most people don't know that. I think I read that more than half of burglaries take place during the day. Uh, they sure do. And, uh, you know, you, and sometimes, you know, when you're, you know, in the backyard mowing, watering, doing the barbecue, they can walk right in your front door and rip you off, and you don't even know it. Yes, absolutely shocking. Um, now, I usually tell people that the majority of burglars don't want a confrontation with the homeowner. Do you agree with that? I do, because it's a much you know, steeper and more um, difficult crime when convicted, and therefore more jail time. But they know that, if, especially if they've cased your house, and they've kind, of, they've kind of peeked in the window, and they've taken a you know, kind of look around and see what they want. They'll, they can get in and out quickly, just take a few things, and they are going to be gone. Absolutely. It can, or, you know, if they know you're away, they can pull up with a moving van. Did you ever see a show called It Takes a Thief? I used to love that show. Oh, yeah. That's a classic. It was on a couple of years ago, and it was two reform burglars mm -hmm. who would uh, set up these break-ins. Yeah. And it, 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 that was very realistic. That's what it looked like. I, I don't know if you can still catch reruns of that show, but... It was very was, good. Yeah, very well done. And they showed exactly how they would, what, what kind of homes they would look for. And they, they were, you know, there were plenty of times where they did pull in with a moving van as if it, and it looked like a moving van, and they were just moving all the furniture out. They took everything in some of these cases. Yep, and uh, it happens before you know it, and it's, um, it's on the rise. So it's, it's something that's, you know, not going away, and it provides job security for people like me. Yep. <laughs> now, what did the statistics show about the presence of a home security system regarding the burglary? Yeah, uh, Temple University uh, a couple years ago did this study that showed that a monitored alarm system makes your home three times less likely to be burglarized versus a home without a monitored alarm system. And then uh, Rutgers University um, closely followed that with a study using five years of data that showed that burglars tend to avoid homes with alarm systems. 
So right there, that indicates that that yard sign that you have out in front of your home is a deterrent in itself. Now, the key message on that is, is that you got to back up the yard sign with having a real security system because, unfortunately, what sometimes people do is they just think the yard sign is a deterrent and they don't have the service. And then it's a false sense of security. And, the, you know, the burglars who are casing your neighborhood or your house, they they can see you, you know, walking into your home, not activating your system mm-hmm. sometimes, and they know it's... Um, you know, not being backed up by a real life security system, and they'll break in. So you got to be able to have you know the system to back up the sign. But if you have all that, then you're you know a lot less likely to be broken into because they'll just go on down to the next house that doesn't have it. Exactly. Now I want to I want to come back to the uh-huh. topic about what people should look for in a security system. But I have one more question to ask you about the those signs that you put outside. Right. I had read uh, some one of these uh, super thieves, super burglars, wrote that it is actually better to put a generic sign up, like this building is equipped with motion detectors and security cameras, rather than one that names a specific alarm company. And he said that the pros know the models of the alarms and the camera sensors and the security systems that most of the large companies use, like ADT, for example, and they can get the specs to these different models and make it easy for them to disable it. Do you uh, have any uh, feeling about that? Well, we we protect right now 6.3 million homes across North America, so we're by far you know the nation's leading company. We you know don't have any issues related to what you're saying. I mean, we protect help protect people you know 24/7. And if that were the case, what you're implying, there would be you know a lot of break-ins going on and a lot of people reporting things and we're just not seeing that so I well, think this is obviously true. a pro who's going to be able to get right. the you know the specs to a security system you know this is not this is not the amateur so I was thinking maybe if you you know do have a very valuable piece of property or something like that maybe this would make some sense I don't know mm. but let's go back to my what we talked about earlier. What are some things that people should look for in a home security system, and how how do you know you're dealing with a reliable company? Like I know it, we know ADT, but right. there are other so, companies. Yeah. So the main thing, the key thing, is monitored security protection. I mean, you want to have the monitoring system to 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 be there when something happens. You don't want to have a do-it-yourself. You don't want to go to Home Depot and buy a simple alarm system and put it up because here's what's going to happen. Um, let's say you live out in the country or you're, you know, in a kind of, you know, an area where you don't have close neighbors. Well, that um, something can break in your home and the thing will beep and no one will hear it. So you've got to have it hooked up to a monitoring center. And it's not only here we're talking about burglary and deterrent, but also our systems – can um, you know help detect fire and carbon monoxide? Mm-hmm. And, and again, if you have like just a battery operated you know carbon monoxide detector that you can buy for thirty bucks at Home Depot, you can sleep right through it. Um, mm-hmm. Or you know you can be upstairs and it's activating downstairs. But when you're hooked up uh, to a monitoring center like ADT, we will get the signal. We will call authorities. They will come to your home if it's a carbon monoxide or, of course, a fire, and they'll break into your home and, you know, wake you up and save your life. And we have many, many cases of this um, happening now, all that, the time. Is that would be part of a basic system, or that's, that's one of the bells system. and whistles you can add yeah, that's, on? That's a basic system, and what we're talking about here, I know people are wondering about pricing, and what we say is it's basically about a dollar a day for monitoring. So, you know, you can count on it being anywhere from, you know, 30 to $40, depending upon, you know, where you live, the size of your home, and, you know, the type of system and stuff that you have. But a dollar a day is nothing um, in terms of the price um, to be able to help provide that peace of mind protection that you need for your family and your valuable possessions. Now, if, if you wanted to add some of the bells and whistles, I... Motion detectors and things like that. How do you feel about those things? I mean, it seems good to me. Oh, yeah. And, of course, the, I'm glad you brought that up because the uh, industry is really evolving. ADT launched just in October what we call ADT Pulse, which is your basic alarm system. But now you can remotely activate it 
through a web-enabled device like an iPhone or an iPad or a laptop from virtually anywhere in the world anytime to, Ooh, control, I like that. to control not only your alarm system to turn it on and off, but you, now you can activate your lights. You can control your thermostat. You can um, do a whole fo- host of different features. You can receive text alerts. I have teenagers. Let's say my wife and I are out. I can put a sensor on the liquor cabinet in my living room, and I can tell if my teenagers are opening it up uh, because I'm going to get a text alert. I can also have a camera in my home send me a video alert. Let's say I'm at work and the package is delivered to my front door. Um, instead of going home to let the delivery man in, I can see him at my front door. I can send a signal to my alarm system to turn it off. I can also activate my door to um, unlock. I can see him come into the foyer, place the package, turn around, walk out, and then I close my door and turn back on my security okay. system. Now look how that's, much time that just that's saved That's amazing. I don't know if I'd love that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, that's where the um, industry is evolving to. And we call it protecting and connecting. And we call it life safety and lifestyle. So you're able, you're able to use your alarm system on a, not only a daily basis, but an hourly basis. And it's helping you, you know, do a whole host of features besides just protecting you. All right. Well, that is, uh, that, that, I, I can't even, does it say you may walk in 12 feet and no more and just put the package on the table or something? It's like, it's really know. incredible. And, I mean, you know, the technology is just allowing us to do that like these days. Jetsons here. All right. If you had one tip to give my listeners the most important thing about burglary discouragement, which is what I call it, what would you tell us? Buy a security system and put a yard out, the yard sign out front. Uh, and how about make sure you turn it on? And use it. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. Make sure uh, you turn it on because. People sometimes are afraid to use them because uh, they're afraid of false alarms or other types of things, but it's so easy. And all you got to do is just get in the habit of it like anything else locking your door, turning your lights off, recycling, whatever. It's just once you get in the routine and the rhythm of doing it, it becomes second nature and you got to do it. Thank you, Bob. That is absolutely correct. Thanks for being with me and giving such important information out. Um, And uh, I have a vacation home safety checklist with uh, the tips that I've talked about on the show today and many more, and you can get that by going to my crimeprevention101.com blog. Uh, Ron, where can they find out more about ADT? Uh, Sorry, Bob, where can they find out more about ADT? Um, ADT ADT.com or what I talked about earlier with ADT Pulse, that would be ADTPulse.com. And thank you so much for having me. All right, my pleasure. And up next, I've got more burglar discouragement tips and a personal safety product that will help keep your elderly loved ones safe. Talk, talk, talk. That's all we do is talk. If you'd like to talk, call us toll-free right now at 1-866-472-5787. 1-866-472-5787. That's it. That's it. VoiceAmerica.com. Every day, people are afraid to report violent crimes. In times like these, choosing to report a crime or helping the police can be a difficult decision. A no-snitching culture has sprung up in our communities, making it unpopular and sometimes even dangerous to report a crime. Do the right thing by calling 911 or your local crime tip line. If you're the victim of a crime, report it. If you know about a crime, report it. To learn more about how to do the right thing, visit ncpc.org or contact your local law enforcement agency. A message from the U.S. Department of Justice, National Crime Prevention Council, and the Ad Council. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can be prevented. Using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real-life examples and success stories, Susan shows how it's done in her new book, Think Fast and Prevent a Violent Crime, How to Respond to Danger in 20 Seconds or Less. Check out www.crimeprevention.com. Prevention101.com for more information. The Internet's number one talk station. Number one talk station. VoiceAmerica.com. You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. 
We invite you to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, and Susan will address some of these on future shows. Send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com. That email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. Hello again. Yes, this is Crime Prevention 101, and like the announcer said, if you would like me to focus on a particular topic here at Crime Prevention 101, just email me, solutions at fightsafe.com. You can also post a comment on my Facebook page. You can tweet it to me, and you might even be a guest on the show. If you give me a good segment idea, I'd love to have you on. All right, now I have a terrific personal safety product that I want to tell you about. This is called Life Shield, and it's, an, it's, a, it's a wireless monitored home security system for those who have relatives who still live on their own. And it is all digital. It's monitored, like, Ron, uh, like Bob was talking about earlier. Uh, but it's not an alarm system. What it does, you can attach sensors to, to all the doors to show everyone who comes and goes, including if your home care attendant, what time they arrive, arrive what time they leave the house. Um, you can arrange to have real-time alerts sent to your phone or your email so that you'll know that the caretaker has arrived. You can also have cameras installed in the, in the home of an incapacitated loved one to monitor visiting nurses and other health care providers so that you can ensure that proper care is being delivered. And, there's all, and, they can, and it can send messages to you about that, this. You can have sensors attached to a medicine cabinet or refrigerator, and it will send you alert uh, when, they take, when your loved one takes the medicine or when they eat, so that way you can confirm that the medicine is being taken uh, regularly and properly and that your loved one is eating. And it can also notify you if somebody is breaking into the home through a window or a door, and they will just dispatch the police, too. So it's kind of a double, sh- double shield. And I, I think I read also that um, they, you, there are all kinds of options if you, it's to notify if your uh, loved one has fallen or things like that. So you want to go to www.lifeshield.com. Or you can call them at 866-222-8580. I'm going to post the link on my crimeprevention101.com blog in the show notes. Now, I've got a couple of more tips for you, burglar discouragement tips. Your most valuable property isn't your money or your jewelry. You want to make sure that you hide priceless items like home movies, photo albums, family heirlooms, sentimental you know, mementos in uncommon hiding places like I talked about earlier, inside a drop ceiling tile, in a laundry basket. You don't want to, them, these things uh, to fall into criminal hands. You also want to make sure that you take special care to hide guns, any guns or weapons that you have. Uh, also equally important, be cautious about hiding or disabling items like computers, CDs, flash drives, medical records, you know, files, checkbooks, bills and papers, uh, anything that might contain your social security number or confidential information. ID theft, unfortunately, is an intended byproduct of a burglary more and more these days, especially if you're dealing with the pro. And they'll, they'll, they can just come up with all sorts of fake IDs for people in your name. So you really want to make sure that you take care of stuff. And even if you're just going to work, it should not be easy to find this kind of information. Don't leave it out easily. You've got to to rethink where you keep these items. If you can't remove important, important items from your home, if you're going away for a while, there are specially designed fake objects like books, candles, Food cans, hairspray cans. There, are, I talked talked about uh, hangers. That it looks like a, a vest or an item of clothing, but it's really a place that you can stash important items. They're inexpensive. They're quite effective. You can get them in catalogs, especially travel catalogs. A couple of uh, psych out signs that will make at least an amateur pause. Put it, put that sign right out in front. Attack dogs trained and sold here. You know or danger, extremely vicious Doberman. And then you want to leave a large, large doggy dish by the front door with the name Cujo or Killer written on it, you know. 
Get a recording of a fierce-sounding barking dog. If you've got an ADT system, it can turn that thing on and off. Put it, set it on a timer so it'll go off periodically. Um, we're going to talk about home invasions next week, and I'm going to talk about this wasp spray rumor. I don't like it as much as pepper spray. Talk about that. Um, there's one other thing that uh, always comes up about uh, setting off uh, the, your car alarm with, with, uh, with your electronic keypad. doesn't work for me. I don't know if, it, if, if yours will. It, mine just opens the door. It doesn't set off the alarm. So be careful about relying on that. Well, you know what? That's a wrap for tonight. Please do not forget. We'd love to hear from you. Send me your comments, solutions at bitesafe.com. Post them on my blog or my Facebook page. Let me know if you read any of the books we talked about tonight. There's some great selections here for you. And if you liked any of the personal safety products that I tell you about on the show, please let me know. Give me your feedback. I'll pass it along to the manufacturers of these products and let them know. Also, tell your friends about us so they can become part of the movement. And you know what? You and I will be doing this again next week, same time, same Internet. It would be a crime not to listen, so stay tuned and stay safe. We hope you got some useful information and inspiration this week on Crime Prevention 101. Susan Bartlestone invites you to join us again next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern Time here on Voice America. If you want to learn more about Susan's guests, sign up for her newsletter, or find out about upcoming teleseminars and workshops, go to www.crimepreventionone.com today. Have a great week and a safe week.